Okay, I'm just gonna double check that we're in good shape and how it looks um, to the public and then we can get started. Okay, so we're good. So uh, Mike Morris, I'm the superintendent of schools and uh, I'd like to call this meeting of the Pelham School Committee to order at 6.35 on today, which is Tuesday, October 27th. Um, for members of the public, the reason I'm calling the meeting to order is the first order of business is to reorganize. Uh, and so when uh, when districts reorganize, when school districts reorganize, the superintendent takes the chair temporarily until a chair is identified and voted in by the committee. At that point, I will gladly hand the virtual gavel over to whoever is the chair of the committee and they can take it from there. Uh, generally for the committee, the way this process works is that I will um, take nominations. One can nominate themselves or nominate others to uh, become the chair. Uh, after that, the chair will take on and do the vice chair and secretary and all those other roles. Um, I'll take as many nominations as there are before I ask the committee for a vote. Ms. Hall? Sorry, I know I'm not chair and I'm not trying to chair. No, but please. <laughs> do the roll call attendance because you called to order and we're virtual. I have never chaired a virtual meeting. I think that's true. So thank I've you for the chair. <laughs> so just throw it out there. <laughs> so I'll do a virtual uh, attendance. So uh, Miss Dancer. Dancer present. Look forward to being in person. <laughs> <laughs> I'm with you. Miss Kenny. Uh, Kenny present. Ms. Barlow. Barlow present. Great. Uh, Mr. Menino. Menino present. And Ms. Hall. Hall present. Great. So I'm not going to repeat what I said, but you all heard it the first time um, about that. So are there any nominations uh, for chair this evening? I nominate Sarah Hall. Okay, so Mr. Mino nominates uh, Ms. Hall. Is there a second? Second. Okay, I think I heard Ms. Kenny first. Um, uh, are there other, Ms. Hall, would that be amenable to you, I should say? I, yes. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if that's the right word or not, but uh, it's the one I'm gonna use. Um, are there other nominations for chair? Seeing none, we'll go to a roll call vote. Ms. Stancer? Stancer, aye. Ms. Kenny? Kenny, aye. Ms. Barlow? Barlow, aye. Mr. Menino? Menino, aye. And Ms. Hall? Hall, aye. Okay, well, I'll turn it over to you, Ms. Hall, and um, to do the rest. All right, thank you. The people have spoken. Um, Okay, so really the only other reorganization we need to do, because we don't have other, um, too many other things going on, is just our uh, reps to the region. So are there any nominations um, for regional reps? Ms. Kenny. Uh, I would like to nominate myself uh, to continue as a regional rep. Um, I now have a child who attends the regional schools um, <clears throat> and uh, I have been working on the uh, negotiating team with the APEA regarding the fancy COVID year. Um, and I would like to be able to uh, see that through till the end. Okay, all right. Uh, yes, Margaret. Um, I guess I will do the same thing and nominate myself. Um, I would really like to continue. Um, we're sort of in the middle of this. And so can I just interrupt? I'm sorry, just as a point of, point of order, there was a motion made and there wasn't a second. So oh. either there has to be a second or the motion doesn't move forward. So I, I didn't mean to interrupt you, Ms. Stancer, but I heard uh, a move and I didn't hear a second. So I don't believe technically the meeting can continue until... Oh. Either there's a second or not a second. That is a great point. You kind of out chaired the new chair. All right, sorry. <laughs> so Margaret, if you could pause one second. All right, so uh, there was a motion for Sarah Best. Uh, I will second that. Um, we don't have to vote on that yet though. Okay, so there was a motion and a second for Sarah Best. All right, I'm sorry, go ahead, Margaret. 
Um, I will nominate myself. I also would like to continue on the region this year. Um, I feel like we're in the middle of, uh, with the COVID and all of the other things that are going on, I would like to see my way through that. Okay. All right. And just to be, I mean, I think it's clear, but we do have two uh, reps to the region. Okay. Any other, oh, sorry. Uh, is there a second? Second. Okay. All right. Any other nominations for the region? Well, I've served for three years. I stepped down, which it was temporary, but apparently it's going to be permanent. Um, uh, there's only two people who can serve. Uh, I guess um, I, I have no objection to Sarah Bess and Margaret serving. I just wish there were three members because uh, basically I don't see any reason to be on the committee if you're not on the region, but uh, so be it. Okay. I mean, it, we we can have more than two nominations, and then we will put it to a vote to the committee. So it is completely acceptable for there to be really any number of nominations. So I don't want you to feel like you don't have a voice in that process. No. Okay. All right. Any other nominations? Okay. Um, and we can vote. I guess if there's just two, we can vote on both at the same time. Is that right? Okay. Um, all right. So there's been a motion and a second for Sarah Bess and Margaret. I will do a roll call vote. Um, Margaret. Stancer, aye. Sarah Bess. Kenny, aye. Ron. Ron, aye. Brenda. Barlow, aye. And Hall, aye. Okay. Um, the only other thing that we have that we don't have to vote for is just the um, representative to the collaborative. I do that now. I'm happy to give it up if someone wants to do it. The meetings are every other month. Um, the big benefit was dinner when it was in person. So it's really hard to sell it. Um, virtually, but if anyone else, I mean, it is like, it is a good connection to other um, school committees in the region and they do a lot of great work. So I'm putting it out there. I don't mind to continue doing it, but if someone else would like to take that on, that's okay with me. Okay. That's what I thought. All right. Um, okay. Next up is public comment. Um, we just had two, um, Dr. Morris, would you mind sharing those? Sure, give me one second and I'll get it loaded. I would just remind the committee if, if they're not um, speaking to mute yourself because I think we're getting some background noise.
Okay, thank you. Um, I know that chart was a little hard to see. I can email that around to the rest of the committee so you can see the whole thing in the context of that one letter. Um, so I will do that. Um, next up is to approve minutes, but we actually do not have those yet. Um, so we will move on to the superintendent's update. And I really, you know, usually we list this, list this as superintendent slash principals update. And uh, because Sasha was out last week, I was doing some quick work um, and I neglected to do that. So this will mostly be principal Whiting Jones update. But um, I think the thing, um, two things I'll share is one, uh, all the staff who, and I think Ms. Whiting Jones will, will speak to this, you know, did phase one. I was able to visit three times while students were there um, over those seven days. And just want to thank uh, from my vantage point, all of the staff members. Um, who participated in that. We saw lots of happy, smiling faces um, and folks happy to be in Pelham School and doing a great job with that. Uh, we've also seen just uh, really amazing work and, and significant improvement in terms of the virtual work that's gone on. And we'll have uh, survey results that we can disaggregate for specific to Pelham School and parent, staff, and uh, feedback. And we'll have those probably by next week uh, set for you to look at. So. Uh, that was the first update. The second update is just that um, Ms. Wedding Jones, Dr. Slaughter, and I were able to meet with the staff this afternoon for an optional meeting to go over the same presentation we'll be making to you in a few minutes um, about some of the financial concerns. And uh, again, want to thank the staff for just really thoughtful questions, uh, really good inquiry, um, but we want to keep the staff members involved and engaged in all the work that's occurring and all the concerns that are being um, that we're gonna share and that we'll have to figure out how to move forward with. We, we certainly, they're a critical part obviously of the school and we wanna make sure that we're tapping them for ideas, resources, um, and just strong communication throughout. So just wanna thank, we had a lot of people on that call, Ms. Whiting Jones. I mean, I think it was the vast majority of staff for an optional meeting on a Tuesday afternoon. Um, so um, I think that's all I wanna share and I'll pass, I'll pass it over to Lee. Oh, I think there's a question first, yeah. I'm sorry. Yep, go ahead, Ron, sorry. Um, <laughs> I forgot what I was gonna say. Oh, uh, I'm not sure it's appropriate at this time, but last time at the original joint meeting, I wanted to say that uh, I have a, an opinion on whether we should ne renegotiate the uh, cutoff point for uh, uh, calling off school, and I was told that was inappropriate to make the comment at the time. It, when is it appropriate? Is it appropriate now to express my opinion? When? It is item six on the agenda. So I think that would be the time. Okay, uh, Lee, do you want to share some of your more specific updates in mind? Sure. Well, it's nice to see you all. Um, so when I think about school, I think in the framework of students, staff, and families. So I'll share a little bit about what's been going on with our students first. So I'll just echo Dr. Morris, having our kindergartners and first graders in school um, was extremely joyful. So as a former first grade teacher, I have really missed seeing the little in, you know, informal moments with students. And it was really nice to see them playing together. Um, two big highlights were Miss Giselle's annual release of the Monarch Butterflies, which she was able to do with students in person. Um, and the kindergartners and first graders with a lot of turn taking were able to create a big, beautiful rainbow made out of leaves that they had collected. So that was out on the field. Um, as a school, we've started having virtual all school meetings and we had one this morning. Um, it had all of the energy of a good party. So we were using the framework of a responsive classroom morning meeting. So it mirrors what students are doing every day in their homeroom classes, but it's on a much bigger scale. So we have time for some sharing and activity. Um, and greeting one another. So this morning, the fourth graders shared their states and capitals song. So if any of you who have had fourth graders probably still have it ringing in your in your head. Um, I've been dropping into a lot of remote classrooms to get to know students. So Ron and I were both in a third grade closing circle last week and played a played a drawing game with students where Ron was a little more successful than me. They've figured out I'm an animal person. So within like 10, you know, 10 seconds, they knew they guessed what I was trying to draw. Um, our students are also engaging in monthly all school reads where the whole school is reading the same 
picture book. So we partnered with High Five Books in Florence to choose 10 books that were either a, a written by diverse authors or about um, stories about children of color. So for September, our book to go along with Hispanic Heritage Month was Island Born by Juno Diaz. And in October, our book was Your Name is a Song by Jamila Tompkins Bigelow. So our staff have been really hard at work, as you all know. We've been continuing to grow all of our expertise in remote learning. Um, and I heard from a teacher this week who said, I cannot get over how eager the students are to have discussions, considering that we're doing it over a computer. Um, so what I'm hearing from staff consistently is they've been able to forge really authentic, meaningful connections with students and are finding ways to engage students in in dialogue and, and build connections between kids. Um, and flexibility is our mantra this year at Pelham. Um, <laughs> we've got uh, our professional learning focused on uh, two big things. The first one is cultivating emotional resilience in educators. So we're using a book called Onward um, to do a lot of reflection and social emotional learning for the adults in our community. And we're also continuing our work around anti-racism and professional development focused on anti-bias work and dismantling white supremacy, which is a continuation of the work that staff did during the summer. Um, and finally, we've been engaging our parent community in a few different ways. So we have had two meetings of our Pelham staff and family book group that are focused on anti-racist texts. So we met in August to discuss the book, How to Be an Anti-Racist. And we met in October to talk about, So You Wanna Talk About Race. And we're gonna try something new. In December, we're gonna meet to talk about the podcast series, Nice White Parents. So you're all welcome to join and I can share the information with you if you'd like to join us. Um, I've continued to hold monthly family forums. A lot of those conversations have focused on logistics and operations and questions about um, remote learning and coming back to school and what all that is going to look like with lots of dialogue about community building and what it looks like in this time. Um, and finally, our PTO has been hard at work. We had a pumpkin patch event in October where all students were able to come to the school and pick up a pumpkin and a little goodie bag. And we just wrapped up our spirit wear fundraiser and our book fair drive, which is a fundraiser for the Pelham Library. And we partnered again with High Five Books. Um, so it was really wonderful to be supporting an independent bookseller um, and also be getting some really great books into the hands of our students and families. So that's really what's what's going on at school, and I'm happy to answer any questions too. All right, thank you. Any questions for Ms. Whiting Jones? All right. Well, I mean, I know that I keep saying it, but just to start as a new principal the way that you have, and to kind of be this together and on top of things when I'm sure it doesn't feel that way. It's just really appreciated. So we appreciate everything you're doing. Uh, Sarah Bass, did you raise your hand? Yeah, I don't have a question. I just had a quick comment. As a parent, I wanted to say how impressed I have been with the teachers, um, the organization and the caring and like the actual like really truly getting to know the kids. I've been just so, so super impressed. Um, so I wanted to say thank you. Yes, I would echo that. Yeah, go ahead, Brenda. Yeah, I also wanted to echo that. It's just really exceeded any expectations that I had for virtual education. And even, you know, both of my children are, are thriving and it's amazing how my, my younger son, even only seven, can really um, work with the teachers to be able to get where they need to go. Certainly, I heard all about the fantastic all school meeting today and the song. My kids already sang it to me. So, and I don't have a fourth grader, but anyway, just wanted to again thank you. It is so wonderful to have you on our community despite the thank unusual. You. I appreciate that. And I'll pass along that wonderful feedback to the staff also. Thank you. All right. Um, next up is enrollment, school choice. 
some budget update things. So I guess, um, Dr. Morris, I'll give it to you to start here. Okay. Yeah, I'll give a little bit of an overview. And I know some of you have been the committee uh, for longer and seen the ups and downs on this. And for others of you, I think the historical context will be important to share. Um, so um, I guess I want to start by saying that, and you'll see this in the data a couple minutes from now, that uh, for, for uh, some time now, um, Pelham has been struggling. There was a time not that long ago where there was over half a million dollars in the school choice um, reserve account. And uh, that number was dwindling. We got to a place a couple of years ago where we were not only kind of even, but actually adding funds in. And now we're sort of pushed back to a place of concern in terms of how much school choice funds we're using. So, you know, I, I do want to compliment the committee for making some hard decisions over the last four years that got us to a better place. And, and I also want to acknowledge how frustrating it is to do that work and um, have it not stick. Uh, I share in that frustration. I know Dr. Slaughter does as well. And Mr. Mangano, who I spoke to the other day, he was asking about it too. He works for the town of Amherst now, but um, those of you who worked with him, uh, he was he was a large part of those efforts as well. And, and I guess what we want to talk about tonight is, is two things. One is the school choice and how that's looking. The other is the drop in enrollment and how that potentially could affect next year's FY22's uh, chapter 78. And uh, we're trying intentionally not to set doomsday scenarios. That's not our goal. At the same time, we felt like it was important for the committee and the community to have access to know that there are real threats, real financial threats out there that we want to talk about and give the committee and the community enough time to, to think about what to do with them. Um, so it's not a last minute thing or it's not a big surprise, but we know enough now that we wanted to bring this to the committee. I think the last thing I want to say, just to be really clear, is there's no line at the end of this presentation that says, and we're going to close the school. That's not where we are. I want to be really clear. I know I've gotten a lot of feedback of like, oh, tonight are you going to like suggest the Pelham School Committee close the school, that's not gonna happen tonight. Uh, you all can do what you want, but I don't think that's your intention either uh, in this, in the end of this conversation. And uh, I think it's always the end, not the or, the end. I do think this committee and the community are gonna have to weigh some variables and, and perhaps take some actions uh, in the next bit so we don't have to have that kind of conversation that we can um, do that. You know, um, Very last thing, and then I'll pass it over to Dr. Slaughter, and I said this to the staff as well, is, Pelham's tax rate is is already pretty high, and it's nearing the $25 cap. Um, so there's not, in my opinion, a way to tax our tax the residents out of the challenge that we see. Um, you know, I was going to get the the real number, and, and I, I lost track of time, hence me being a couple minutes late to the meeting. So I wasn't able to get it, but I think it's in the neighborhood of $23 um, per thousand evaluation. We can get the exact number for you. Maybe even Dr. Slaughter's presenting. I can I can try to look that up. Uh, but I want to be clear that this is actually the community is going to have to figure out how it wants to be sustainable and what steps it want to take. I don't think there's, um, you know, uh, kind of a money tree at the end of this that's going to happen. And that was confirmed with a conversation I had um, this week with the chair of the finance committee of Pelham. Um, they're very supportive. They're very dedicated to the school. Um, they already dedicate a significant the majority of the town budget goes to um, the schools between Pelham and the region. And so uh, we want to be realistic that I think passivity is, is not going to be our friend on this one. And um, that's about as much introduction, maybe even more than it should have done. So I'll turn it over to Dr. Slaughter, who's got a very short slide deck. And, and we have some follow up even from when we, the slides were put together last week about, you know, some next steps we're thinking about on our end. And then we hope to engender some dialogue from the committee uh, about what, what steps you might want to think about. But I'll turn it over to, to Doug. That sound all right, Doug? Yes. I'm going to try to share just what you need to see and not everything. Um, let me actually. There we go. Hopefully that uh, everyone can see that at this point. And so what we can see, nobody? We, sorry, we can't see it yet. Um, As Doug's working on that, the Pelham tax rate's about twenty-two dollars per thousand in valuation last year. My apologies. Okay. Uh, and Doug, if you can't bring it up, I can see if I can, I'm able to do that. Well, it's telling me I'm sharing. I'm not sure that it really is sharing. Um, not sure why, but. 
let's Kind of like the live TV version of uh, catastrophe, right? Um, let me try this again. Let me see. Any display of a of a of a uh, ah. Is that no, yeah, now we can see it. All right. So what we have, uh, this is just a, a sort of the first slide. Um, and this is, you know, uh, for Mr. Menino's uh, benefit, I got the, the new Pelham logo on there. So that's that's really for him at this point. Uh, I'll begin with talking about Chapter 78. Uh, a couple of things about that. So recently, Governor released a new version of uh, the budget. Uh, basically, he restarted the budget process like he usually does in, in January. In that new budget, uh, he the projection for Chapter 78 for, for Pelham was slightly higher than what we, we were talking about last uh, spring. And so it's about $2,800 more. So that's the good news for the current year if that tends to uh, or holds true as they go through the rest of the budget process. Um, just to sort of paint the picture about Chapter 78, uh, it's based on foundation enrollment. Foundation enrollment is, is the kids that Pelham is financially responsible for. So school choice kids that come to our school are not part of foundation enrollment, kids that go out to charter or choice out, and obviously kids that attend school in, in Pelham uh, are part of that foundation enrollment. Uh, the thing we're noticing is that the, uh, the, the enrollment numbers from this October, which will be used to set the fiscal 22 uh, foundation uh, aid for chapter 70, uh, the, that enrollment's dropped about 14% or so, pretty significant drop in local kids. Uh, a lot of different reasons for that. Um, but that can have some pretty profound effects on, on our Chapter 78 coming into next year. Um, so coming into this year, uh, you know, with the implementation of the Student Opportunity Act and, uh, and the hold harmless provision within that, uh, school districts that, that had drops in enrollment uh, were held harmless, and, and Pelham was as well. The Pelham, Pelham uh, coming into this year did not have a drop in enrollment, but uh, the funding level was held steady from, from fiscal 19, fiscal 20, uh, into fiscal 21. Uh, however, in past history, before the Student Opportunity Act, the, the changes in enrollment tended to track pretty, pretty evenly with the with the changes in enrollment uh, tracked with the, with the funding in Chapter 78. So, uh, for school districts that had drops in enrollment, they had similar drops in Chapter 78. We don't know exactly how this is going to play out in, in Fiscal 22. Uh, depends on how many of the provisions of, of the Student Opportunity Act are, are able to be uh, upheld as we move forward. Uh, I think uh, Superintendent Morris may have a little more information on that. He had a conversation with the folks at, at DESE today. But if those, if, if the drop in enrollment and the uh, Chapter 78, you know, move in sync, uh, a 14% a drop is roughly a $33,000 reduction in Chapter 78, Chapter 78 that we might see in fiscal 22. And that's, we're just going to have to see how this plays out, um, both in the current year with the current uh, fiscal 21 negotiations as they finish the budget for 21 and as we roll into fiscal 22. So uh, that's a that's a little bit of scary news as we move ahead. Uh, but again, we'll we'll have to see uh, how that plays out relative to our our fun, our foundation enrollment. I can move ahead a slide and actually, Doug, could you stay with that one for one yeah. second? I'm sorry. Sure. Um, so the thing I'd add that and Dr. Slaughter referenced this is that I'd uh, superintendent had a conference call with Desi today. Uh, I think I mean you know it reassured us about FY21 not going um, negative that, that the hold harmless I think will be held so to speak. Um, Desi was pretty clear they anticipate that that won't be true in FY22. In other words, the enrollment drop will have an impact on the FY22 budget for the Pelham Public School. Um, there was a lot of consternation about that. We're not the only districts that's seeing a reduction in enrollment, um, although it's more dramatic here than perhaps many other places. And I think the only thing we heard was that, well, if you see a dramatic increase from, for instance, October 1st to November 1st, 
let us know, but otherwise plan on seeing that number reflected in the FY22 budget for your school district. So uh, that was not welcome news um, for me and some other superintendents to hear about. But, uh, you know, based on that, I would anticipate there being some drop on Chapter 78, um, absent some other change from the legislature about how those funds were um, are going to be allocated. So um, that was the update as of, uh, I think, uh, 11, or 11 o'clock or noon conference call I had today. And I, well, before we go on, because the other slides are more about choice, I want to pause and see if there was questions from the committee uh, about the Chapter 70 piece. Um, none of us can see each other. Can we maybe stop screen sharing for a minute? Oh, wait. Okay. I can. All right. Does any, do anyone have questions? Raise your hand prominently because they're very small. Uh, yeah, Ron, go ahead. Does that mean that the state support for public schools will decrease next year? Uh, as an aggregate, um, likely not. I think it's really about distribution. Um, especially as the Student Opportunity Act was designed to uh, offer more funds and more equity for districts that have a harder time raising a tax rate because of the population of residents that they have. Um, those districts generally are not seeing a drop in enrollment. It's much more suburban and rural districts that are seeing a drop in enrollment. Um, so I think it's much more about distribution than total. Uh, I think whether the chapter 70A can go up or will it stay flat or reduced based on COVID related budget impacts is anyone's best guess right now. Yep, Margaret, go ahead. So the hold harmless part of this, you know, there was that study being done about hold harmless and there were, there were groups advocating to get rid of hold harmless is that is that reflected in this statement or am i not really understanding what hold harmless really means um do you want to take that one doug you want me to try uh, you can go ahead and try <laughs> All right. so i think hold harmless is generally uh more directly referring to um not dropping funding let me see if I can start back. So the state sets what's called the foundation budget. And so that's based on a whole variety of factors, enrollment, the, the specific details in the enrollment. For instance, if you have a high number of ELL students um, or low income students, the state may apportion more funds for that because of um, how they see, uh, how they define need. And so Pelham, like, uh, like the region as well, um, are well above foundation budget. In other words, the state gives us funds that if they were just gonna scale back, they could say, well, Pelham, the town of Pelham's already giving you more money than you quote unquote need. Um, and we're gonna give you less money as a result of your town paying more than its share, so to speak. You know, um, There are a few communities, um, Chicopee being one, uh, that not, not now, but at least a couple of years ago, they, they were at foundation. In other words, the city of Chicopee was only covering the cost of what the state said it had to cover. And those are mostly urban areas that are um, have high concentrations of low income uh, people. So what they've decided a uh, long ago is they're not gonna, uh, uh, they're not gonna take funds away from communities just because the communities spend more than they quote unquote need to do. In other words, they weren't gonna penalize communities for overspending. Uh, I'm not saying that in a real way, but from the state formula perspective, overspending on their schools um, that if you know they were going to set a foundation they were going to fund the foundation and um, that was the way it was going to work and so i think when they talked about hold harmless that's why it have such an impact on many communities like pelham who pay more than their fair share quote unquote uh, according to the state formula but don't face any sort of negative consequences for that um, if you look at vermont for instance a very different funding model and every dollar you spend in Vermont above foundation essentially gets, re, you know, some of the, that dollar gets redistributed to other districts. So if you want to spend more than the state says, awesome, but they're going to redistribute some of those funds as well. And um, so, you know, I think when it's the hold harmless, um, that's more what it's referring to is the paying more than what foundation would suggest that the town of Pelham has to cover to fund the education of the students of Pelham. Doug, how'd I do? I think pretty well. That pretty much captures it, I think. Okay. All right. 
All right, I saw other hands, I think Brenda and then Sarah Best. Did you also have a question? Okay, all right, Brenda first and then Sarah Best. Okay, I just have a question about the 14%. Is that the number that it would be if the enrollment uh, October 2021 was the same as it is right now? So I think I can take that one as well. So the way that this works is that the current enrollment will af will affect next year's budget. So um, the current the enrollment that was captured on October first let it goes into a formula that sets the FY twenty two budget. So it's always a year behind. The funding you get the next year is based on the the student enrollment on the prior year captured on October first. Because uh, otherwise they'd be adjusting during a fiscal year and that would be quite disruptive. So it's not a concern for this fiscal year. It's a concern for the following one. Can I just follow up? Um, so does that mean if we had some of our families come back next year and then on October 2021 that the foundation enrollment was greater, then it might not be such a big decrease for the F uh, fiscal year 2022? So next year's enrollment would affect. So so the enrollment that's captured on October of 2021 would actually influence the FY23 budget. It's always lagging a year behind. Oh, I got it. Um, yeah, sorry, I wasn't clear about that. That's like this is my first time around, so thank you. Oh, no, 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 it's all, you know, complicated stuff for sure. If, if I can just add for a second on that, the, the chapter 70 formula is pretty complex to say the least. Um, and so that's part of why from the state level, they, they sort of use the October numbers because they have to essentially kind of crunch the numbers in order for the governor to put out a budget and then the House and Senate to, to debate that budget and, and do their own work uh, by the beginning of January. And so in that, you know, uh, you know, the numbers are as of October 1, they technically get reported at basically uh, Thursday this week is the deadline. Some districts will lag a little bit in getting those numbers to the state. Uh, so the state has basically a month to kind of crunch those numbers into a, a what they think the the formula is going to produce for for the uh, for the lion's share of state aid for for um, for chapter seventy, and so that's why there's that lag of a year. Um, so if you have huge or or if you have large peaks or or uh, reductions in enrollment, it can be really difficult because it it impacts the next school year. So, for example, that fourteen percent drop this year. Uh, has a stronger effect next year, but if those students all come back next year, um, that's a potentially difficult circumstance because we've got more kids, but a smaller resource from the state in aid. All right. um, Sarah Best and then Ron, I see your hand. So go ahead, Sarah Best first. Um, so I think I'm beginning to understand the way this works, but um, since a lot of this has to do with um, COVID, is there any way to use CARES funds to help with that? Is there, I don't, I don't know how it all works as far as like the school part with the town or all of those pieces, but um, is there, is there some piece that can help offset that at least as in, in not like a long-term fix, but as a, at least band-aid for right now to help out? Um, so, oh, go ahead, Doug. Please. I was going to say, unfortunately, no. I mean, the current, you know, uh, CARES Act monies are for uh, sort of more immediate spending, and particularly to uh, accommodate expenses you didn't anticipate relative to to this. I do think the drop in enrollment, you know, some aspect of that is related to the to the virus and its impact, and and so potentially if there's a subsequent uh, sort of CARES Act, uh, you know, that could could help support us in the coming year. Um, and, it, you know, also the state could also potentially, you know, take action relative to how they do chapter 70 this year. Um, you know, I think their revenues are down, so it's gonna be difficult for them to do that, I think. But but uh, it's it's unfortunate there's a lag like this. There's not, uh, un unfortunately, an, uh, an immediate source to help us out. Again, this drop in enrollment right now, is it gonna impact this fiscal year, or this school year? It's really next year where this, uh, Will come into play, and and we should get a sense of those numbers. Hopefully, in in uh, in early January, when the when the governor's budget comes out, we'll we'll make predictions of it before then. But but uh, we'll have a, a little better sense in early January. And I think you know, just to add to that, um, we will see uh, whether this bears out or whether the hold harmless will, like it did this year, will cover you know changes in enrollment. There was definitely, I will say, the commissioner got. Um, 
a plethora of feedback uh, on the impact this would have on multiple districts around the state because we're not alone. Um, so maybe that feedback will go somewhere and this won't be something that we actually have to manage. But, I, you know, it's real right now. And until someone says, no, it, it won't affect us, uh, I didn't want the committee to be unaware and then, you know, us get the governor's budget and then be surprised by it. So this isn't a certainty. When we get to school choice, that's going to be much more clear as a where we're sitting at the moment and the numbers are really clean that way. Um, this one is more an early heads up on something that could be a problem down the road. Okay. Ron, go ahead. I think it's very important to try to estimate what Pelham resident population would be on October 21, because just in case it bounces back, this is a one year problem we're facing and that will be, be taken care of in 22 and 23. So I don't know how we do that, but it's very important for us to try to estimate what enrollment will be a year from now. Yeah, go ahead, Mike. Um, so uh, on that note, we agree. And Debbie Westmoreland right now is working on identifying who are the 111 students between the three districts who uh, have, why, why have we dropped by that amount? She's identifying who those families are um, she's giving a survey and we're going to have direct phone calls for families asking three core questions. One is, uh, why did you choose to leave the district this year? The second question of where did you go? Um, we get, eventually get that in December and January in school attending report, but we don't want to wait. Uh, and the third question is, are you planning on coming back next year? Um, so that we have that information exactly as you described, Mr. Menino, and can use that in our planning for next year. So we, we agree and we're, we're on it. Okay. Any other questions on the chapter 70 piece before we move to the next slide? No? Okay. All right. Go ahead. Thanks, Doug. Um, so now we'll talk about uh, school choice and how we, how we work with that. Um, different from the chapter 70, the, cho the school choice revenue we receive each year on the, based on the number of students that attend in that year. So it's, it's a little more uh, current. Uh, so we can estimate or need to estimate it uh, kind of as we go. Um, and in order to sort of mitigate peaks and valleys, we've created what's called a revolving fund, which allows us to carry funds over uh, across fiscal years. So we can can uh, try to level out uh, unexpected rises or drops in in expense and and use those uh, those funds to help us uh, carry through uh, the, the big changes like we're seeing in, in enrollment this year. Um, but it's essential as we as we use that sort of fund to keep us a healthy balance in that revolving fund to to uh, preserve it over time and, and allow us to uh, to manage our, our finance as well. Um, and, and Superintendent uh, spoke earlier a little bit. Uh, I'll show you a slide uh, that shows the sort of history of that a little bit. You can see how we've had some some uh, some times when it's been more or less difficult to, to keep our balance in good health. Um, a couple of notes. Uh, our actual revenue for fiscal 20 was below what we anticipated, um, which resulted in a greater use of that revolving fund balance last year. Um, so that was that was a little uh, disappointing news uh, to some extent. And then and then for this current year, and I think this is important as we move ahead. And part of why we bring this to you is that we budgeted use of about two hundred eighty-two thousand uh, dollars from those school choice revenues uh, in the current year, given the drop we've we've kept in place or has, has sustained for a second year in a row in school choice students, the current estimate we have for income is going to be 225,000 or so. And that means we're overspending by about $57,000. And so this is a second year of a significant uh, expenditure above our income. Uh, and it's, and it's beginning to put a strain on this balance. Uh, and as I go to the next slide, you'll, you'll be able to see that a little bit more detail. What we have on this slide, and I'll zoom in in just a moment, I'll just talk to the broad thing. At the top is more of what we were looking at last spring when we were doing budgeting. Uh, and down below is, is sort of where we are now. And I'll zoom in a little bit. Hopefully we can see this a little bit better. Um, if I get too big, it may be, hopefully that'll work. The, so we were anticipating receipts last year in about the $300,000 range, which is what I'm circling here. Um, and so we were expecting at the end of the year to have our balance only drop by about $19,000. Uh, 
um, which is what this change to balance is. And we were expecting for the for the coming year, the current year we're in now, we were hoping to be basically uh, even or, or actually adding to our balance just a little bit. Um, but if we roll down to this section here where we're looking at uh, more current numbers in that regard, um, what you can see here is that our use of, of the revolving fund was much larger last year than anticipated. So our balance at the end of the year was lower than we expected. And as we come into this year, um, again, our, our revenue estimate smaller than what we anticipated. Uh, we corrected that uh, based on, on information from the state and, and our the actual kids that are enrolled with us. And so our impact on, on our balance is again, a negative one of about $57,000. And so you see this number here, this 218, 219, is essentially where we're going to end fiscal 21 with regard to our uh, balance for for uh, the school choice revolving fund. And, and the difficulty is that we will not be able to continue to sustain ourselves in the same programs and, and operational structure that we have now because this balance will ultimately go away completely uh, and, and fairly quickly. And so that's part of why we're bringing this to your attention. Uh, so you can think about what options we have and 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 steps we can take uh, to sort of uh, cons you know uh, mitigate the impact of this uh, current balance situation, um, and so that you know there are options available to us, and and so that uh, needs to be discussed by you guys, and the decisions are yours to make. But nonetheless, uh, we wanted to bring these to you to, to look at. Um, the other thing I'll point out here is if you look at this ending balance and perhaps this one here where we talk about the change to the fund balance, the ones with parentheses are negative numbers, which are, you know, impacting the, the budget in a negative way or impacting our balance in a negative way. And so you see there were several years here where we were building the balance. We got it up to about a half a million dollars. And then we had a, a few years of really difficult times and we dropped that back down. And so uh, my predecessor, you know, in the in the subsequent years here started to rebuild that balance back up to a, a sort of safe and sustainable level. Uh, but again, we've seen a downward trend here in the last couple of years. And so we we need to uh, consider our options and and think about what our our uh, actions will be relative to, to keeping and sustaining our program in, in, uh, in Pelham the way we'd like it to be. And so... I if I could add to that, Doug, yeah. just a second. So, you know, one of the questions that came up when we were meeting with staff a little earlier is how long is this sustainable? So, you know, if we end, if this projection ends up being true, and we don't see that much mid-year choice changes. So, you know, I think this is a reasonable estimate at this point. Um, it means that we've gone down roughly $140,000 in the last two years. Um, if you project that forward, um, We'd be less than a hundred thousand. We'd have less than a hundred thousand dollars in the school choice account. At that point, I would have really grave concerns about the finances of the district, and then how that would influence, frankly, the finances of the town. Um, so I think you know Doug used a helpful marker before of you know this is roughly a quarter of the fund balance being used each year. You know we we can't. That's not something we can sustain. Um, so I just thought it was helpful, Doug, when you said it earlier, and I just want to repeat that here. Uh, just about the impact of that. And, and I want to also acknowledge that, you know, there, it's not that there's no not new choice students. Um, you know, Principal Whiting Jones has done a great job of outreach and, you know, contacting families. Uh, the reality is in COVID times, we're seeing how many kids can we get in a class that limited, you know, um, some choices that we had. Uh, so some of this is around people not wanting to change schools or change districts during a pandemic, which seems quite reasonable. Some of this is about not really knowing and being able to guarantee what our program was was going to look like in terms of in person or virtual, and some of this was just you know a condition of the general where we are in the world these days. In my opinion, it wasn't for lack of effort. It wasn't for negative perceptions of of Pelham. We planned to build this up, as you remember when we discussed this last year. I think we had a good plan to do that, but uh, you know there were some applicants we weren't able to accept because of seats in person and space and capacity. Uh, and then there was a whole lot of people, both in Amherst, the region, and in, well, not the region, but Amherst and Pelham, who were school choice applicants who said, you know what, I'm good. You know, I don't think this is the moment to change the community where I am at. Um, so uh, I do want to, you know, acknowledge that fact. I also want to acknowledge that I'm not sure it'll be much different next year in terms of people's willingness to change schools 
uh, for us to be able to guarantee exactly what this looks like. I'm a, I'm a tend to be a little pessimistic uh, that we'll all be done and everything will be back to normal in March or April of next year. I know some people maybe think that, that I pray that they're right. Uh, I'm just not convinced that they're right uh, on that front. So, um, you know, it does really bring up significant challenges uh, as we think about the future of the school that we don't have um, great solutions for. And I thought maybe we'd just mention a couple things here and then open up for dialogue. Um, two, two, good, two pieces of good news. So it's not all uh, this harsh news. One is that uh, at the current time, we are not slated to have any charter school students. We'll get the confirming report in December. And then in the spring, as you all may be aware, Pelham has had not the best history of those reports being accurate. Uh, but we do have about nineteen thousand uh, dollars that you all passed in the uh, included in the budget last year that was voted uh, as a contingency. And if that ends up being true that we do not have any charter school students, that can be used to mitigate some of the the loss here. The second is a, a more um, uh, atypical piece of good news. So um, the short story are, is that um, gymnasiums tend to have not the best ventilation because they're not designed as such and they're high, there's a lot hard, high, high amounts of cubic volume. So having good ventilation in gyms is not, not the easiest thing. There's also high interest right now in indoor spaces uh, that have good ventilation for winter for athletics and other events. We are doing our phase three uh, air ventilation testing. And while we don't have all of the final results, we did get an initial result for Pelham's gym, which is actually fabulous in terms of ventilation. Um, our facilities director believes the only reason it would be so high is because it's a gym slash cap auditorium. So the HVAC system was designed for many more students that would typically be in a gym class or participating in gym. So uh, we have, you know, and I, I want to make sure I get feedback on this tonight. And, and I think, Doug, you could probably, actually, I can do it. Just take down the slide um, for now, or I can just do this um, so people can see each other. You could leave it up, Doug, and if people want to see it, I can just pull it back on the screen. Um, you know, we, we have had some vendors, uh, some folks interested in rental of the gym, depending how often it gets rented. Um, it could be a pretty significant financial um, benefit to the community. I know it's an atypical one. Um, Pelham actually is not, unlike Amherst in the region, doesn't even have a facilities use calculator to rent um, space. So we get the good news, we get to create it and supply demand right now is in our favor. Um, I did talk about this with the finance committee chair this week and um, quite graciously, he said, you know, the schools are having these challenges, that money can go to the schools, whatever you earn, you earn, you came up with creative ideas and you're able to implement it with your staff. Um, that's great. Right now, there's a bunch of stuff in there, but we have a plan for where that stuff could go. Um, you know, if you've, uh, actually none of you have been to the school except Lee, I should say. But you know, there's there's a little bit of human power that would be involved in getting this set up. Um, but it could be, um, you know, for you know, maybe even optimistically, if things broke perfectly right, even more than four digits of income that could come in this winter, um, because they're really, you know, there's not a lot of indoor spaces that are testing well in this regard. You know locally and regionally, uh, because gyms generally weren't designed that way. So, you know, those are the two uh, silver linings or, or good points we have is that if we can maintain the no charter school students, that would be a huge help for the budget. And then we may have this kind of odd opportunity to have some income in an unusual way uh, this winter. But that that's, I think, all we want to say. I want to look at Doug uh, in terms of presentation. And, and really, we wanted to open it up for questions, comments, and, and, and dialogue about uh, and reactions to this information. Okay. All right. Well, thank you both. As always, thank you for bringing this up early so we can actually have conversations when we're not in a moment of crisis. So I appreciate that. Um, Two Ron, questions. Go ahead. Um, the school choice balance. Uh, at the end of fiscal 21, uh, how many more years do we have until it goes below 100,000? The way I figured, we have two years beyond the end of fiscal 21 before it was likely go below 100,000. Is that correct? Assuming that it's a constant variable of- um, We have a bad year like this year. Right, so if you assume that same number going forward, then that, that would be an accurate prediction. And uh, at uh, the last uh, joint meeting in the region, I asked, uh, could we provide it with the um, this year, last, last year, comparison of Pelham residents and choice? 
how many Pelham did we have this year? How many last year? How many choice students did we have this year versus last year? Is that going to be added tonight? Or, uh, well, is that going to be added tonight at another presentation? So the number of choice students is, I believe, on uh, Doug's slides. Uh, it's that left-hand column that you can see. So uh, we're down from 58 two years ago to 41 last year to 40 it's this year. 58, 41, and how many? 40 right now. So uh, we were and hoping for a, a significant increase, and it went the other way. And Pelham students? Um, that I don't have in front of me. I wonder if in the dialogue, Ms. Whiting Jones may be able to pull for us. Because I'd like to you know basically, <laughs> they basically how many Pelham students we lost this year. Yeah, Ms. Whiting Jones. Yeah, so I have for this year we currently have seventy-two students who and live in Pelham, her. and forty who Pardon? are in yeah. place. So 72 are Pelham and, how many, and 40 are Choice. So we currently so how have 112 students did we have enrolled. last year. So I think it'd be a reduction. That would be a reduction of one Choice student and 11, excuse me, one Choice, yeah, one Choice student and 11 Pelham resident students from last year to this year. So we had 83 last year? Mm -hmm. I believe the foundation enrollment was technically 84. Oh, my apologies, Mr. Slaughter. Thanks for catching that. Well, but it, the thing with foundation enrollment is that there are kids that you don't physically see in the building. Yeah, sure. So there's a couple of those in there. Um, and so I think this year it's going to be 72 ish in that regard. So there's that, that's that 14% is that dozen kids. Um, so we can we lost one choice student? Sorry, Ron, will you repeat your question? We only lost one choice student this year? I think the way I just said is that we have one fewer choice student this year than last year. Um, it may be a net of a couple students who are new choice students and a couple students who aren't here. So I wouldn't think about it as one student. The net okay. is one fewer student. Okay, thank you. Um, so can we, uh, partly for review for existing members, but also for new members, I mean, this is a lot of information to take in. I'm sure there will be more questions on that, but also in terms of timing for when we're going to, like, so we have this survey that Debbie Westmoreland is doing so we can find out about who has left. We have these this potential use for the gym, all of these other things. But then we also have this time frame for working through the FY22 budget. Can we just talk about that really briefly to set the table for what the next several months will look like? Sure. So uh, what's typical, our typical pattern is that when early January, our first meeting in January, we will present an overview of the FY22 budget. Um, I'll be honest, it's gonna be a little tricky to do that this year without having the governor's budget because no one really knows what the governor's budget's gonna look like. So I think it may be an exercise more than um, it typically is. Um, you know, We may actually wanna schedule that sometime in late January instead of early January, given the uncertainty, not just because of enrollment, but just because no one really knows what FY22 looks like um, in general. I heard that loud and clear at the state level today. Um, so it may make sense to push that meeting back. In February, we generally do a detailed budget that has ads and cuts associated with the finance of it. In March, we typically um, uh, ask the school committee to pass the budget so it can get on the town meeting warrant in the spring. Um, I do think in the interim two months at least, uh, before we get into that process, having some dialogue about what options may be out there that are worth pursuing or considering. Um, I'm, I'm being intentional in my verbs. I'm not saying doing, but considering and exploring uh, may be worthwhile. One thing I said this afternoon to the staff, I don't think there's any new ideas out there, right? There's already been two working groups over the last 10 years that have explored this very same issue. I think the very same solutions are uh, potentially on the table that were on the table two years ago or two or three years ago, uh, and then seven or eight years ago that this was studied. Uh, the question is whether the committee and the community uh, feel like the time is right to go dig in on some of those more than we, the committee and the community decided in the past. Um, so I do think that's work that's separate from the FY22 budget, but I think it is kind of the long-term thinking about wanting to explore or not any of those options. Sorry, that was more 
long-winded than I your question required. <laughs> no, that, that's, no, I, I just felt like having a little bit of a global explanation was helpful too. And just to be clear that you're talking about regionalization, you didn't. I mean, I did not say that, but that's one of the options that was talked about. We also in the past have talked about, you know, is is it makes sense to shrink the school size and, you know, and, and look at multi-age classes. I'm not advocating for any of these things to be really clear. I'm just repeating what, yeah, I just want to say it for, for people watching. I think you all may know that I'm not advocating, but. Um, no, no, know, no. The, I mean, for people who didn't have the history to know what things had been studied previously. So those things were regionalization, so I, and I genuinely don't know all of them for my history. Yeah. So regionalization, I know about smaller school size. Yeah, so looking at if there's economy of scale um, that could have could be developed to, you know, if, if the number of students decrease enough, uh, are there ways to reduce the scale of and costs in the school? Um, so that was one that was mentioned. There yeah. was a talk a couple of years ago of doing something, you know, having a themed school. Um, you know, like STEM came up, arts came up, um, you know, um, that was one that also came up. Those were the three kind of tangibles that when I was looking back at my notes before the meeting that I saw reflected, um, that last one was more about um, how to attract more school choice students. It went magically. There's no funding attached to becoming a STEM school, but the idea was, you know, is that something that would draw? I also think it's worth sharing my personal belief about this, or uh, not belief, I guess, um, theory. Um, we just have declining school age enrollment in Western Mass in general. So I want to be really clear that I don't believe Pelham School is a less attractive school choice option. I'm not hearing that from families anywhere. Uh, we are just seeing a trend of fewer school age children uh, in Hampshire and Franklin County. And that's not about private schools or charter schools. Certainly that has some impact. It's uh, especially this year with private schools. It's a more general piece that there are fewer children who are school aged in our general area. So when we think about declining enrollment, we're seeing declining enrollment all over the place, particularly in Franklin County, but somewhat in Hampshire County as well. So, um, you know, uh, I'm not speaking dubiously about that last option, but I do think um, I'm not hearing people saying, oh, Pelham schools and the school used to be or anything other than wonderful things. Uh, but when there are fewer school-aged children, it's gonna have an impact, right? Um, on how many students, what the demand is for school choice. And I think we've seen that over the last few years. Uh, actually, in, in, in a couple of the districts as well. Thank you. And just to be clear, I didn't mean to take us on a complete tangent. I just wanted the the no. <laughs> um, Margaret and then Ron. Yep, go ahead, Margaret. Thinking about shrinking the school. I mean, I know this is not the time to talk about this, but. Do we anticipate that the decision about moving sixth graders to the middle school will be done by the end of next year? That's up to all of you and your colleagues in the other two districts. Um, you know, we'll get to my goals in a little bit. And I think there is a desire from the committee's part to have at least a study done this year. Um, I, you know, where that study goes and what decisions are made is really up to the, the committees. I think it'd be in everyone's best interest for that decision to be made um, by the, at least the end of this year or the beginning of the following one, because I think right now it's just one of these lingering questions that it continues to, the fact that it's unanswered, I'm not suggesting what the answer is, but the fact that it's unanswered leads to lots of problems. And I'll have an Amherst school committee meeting soon and we'll talk about the problems around their building project and not knowing whether it's sixth grade's there. So I do think one way or the other, closing the loop on that and the next, calendar year, like, you know, by October of next year is going to be really important. All right. Ron, go ahead. Well, I had one question, but uh, Margaret's point raised another question. Uh, uh, does that mean that if we move the sixth grade to the middle school, that uh, state chapter 70 money would go down? I know that we, we obviously spend less money in the Pelham School because we don't have the sixth grade teacher. Uh, but does that mean that state aid goes down also? Yes. Yes, it would go with the students to the middle school, essentially. And um, not to reinvent the wheel, but I was a member of that school options committee, and I believe they made a report. Uh, could we have a list? Of some of the crazy options that were, pardon me, some of the alternatives uh, that were presented to, to save money? 
Absolutely. Could somebody make that list? I don't know where that report is. Yeah, the devil, devil, pull it up. We'll, we'll get it out to everybody. That's it. And to be clear, I'm not looking for Doug and I and Lee aren't looking for a decision tonight. It was actually just to engender the type of dialogue that's occurring. Um, I don't want to, people to feel like, oh, at the end we have to make we have to do something. It's actually this I, is I the, realize that, but, but it'd be it'd be nice to be reminded of some of the choices so no, so that we know what we can add or subtract from those choices. Yeah. Um, Brenda and then Sarah Best. I wonder if we have any information on the school choice students that we've lost, or is it that we're just not bringing in students at the kindergarten and first grade level, or what does that look like? Because we know some of those students may be people who are choosing to homeschool or private school um, because of remote learning. There may be other students who just aren't coming in. I'm wondering if um, our preschool is still considered a feeder school, and if, that's, if those numbers are impacting things. Um, so Lee, I don't know, you don't have to comment on that. You've, you've been here a total of, uh, you know, one cycle, one beginning of a cycle of this. I'll give you my perspective, but Lee, I know you've spoken to families directly. So if there's anything you want to share, please feel free to jump in. Um, I do think what we're seeing and we're seeing it regionally, not just in our district is as there's fewer students, there's just fewer students applying for school choice across our region. Um, just as the school age population declines in our area. So, uh, you know, we are still getting students from preschool. You know, we don't, obviously the preschool is not up and running this year, but, um, you know, we're also seeing as enrollment, as those grade levels go up, we did have some high school choice grade levels that graduated up to the middle school and we're not seeing them replenished in the kindergarten first grade level. So it's sort of, you have to look at both ends of it. Who's leaving the district and going to the region, gay for the region for getting that money, but that doesn't help you all. Uh, well, only Sarah Bess and Margaret anyways, after the vote tonight. Um, but then when we look at the lower grades, we're not seeing the same um, same numbers come in. So it's the attrition. It's not individual attrition, like we're losing school choice students, but we're not maintaining the same, same level of them. But um, Lee, if you want to add anything to that, feel free to. Sure. So I'm just looking at the breakdown by grade level. And so there's a lot of variability. So in fifth grade, for example, we have three choice students. But in fourth grade, we have 10 school choice students. And I don't really know what accounts for that difference. Um, other than, you know, maybe there are, were a whole bunch of families who knew each other in a community with kids all the same age and said, hey, let's, you know, all go to Pelham together. Um, you know, I think that's the kind of thing that would be really interesting to hear from families, you know, why, why they are coming to Pelham and how they heard about it and, and just getting a little bit more information about, um, about our school choice families. But to speak to your question, Brenda, our current kindergarten has 19 students, seven of them are choice students. Um, and our first grade currently has 13 students, five of them are choice. So fewer than half in both of those classes are school choice right now. So I can't speak, I don't have the data about how many of those students attended the Pelham preschool program. I do know anecdotally, it's been a really, um, a really good feeder system for school choice, um, but I don't have the exact answer for you on our current students. Any other questions? Oh, yeah, sorry, I'm Sarah. Sorry, Sarah Bess, go ahead. Um, so I'm looking at the, um, the lower budget lines. Um, so I see in like fiscal year, uh, hold on, let me figure out where I was. These are, so, okay, so I have, I wasn't part of the school committee. So what was the difference that happened between, uh, what is that, 16 and 17? Cause that's only one kid, but it looks like a huge jump or one student, but it looks like a big jump and in the increase slash decrease of choice ones all the way at the side on the, on the right hand side. And then also, <clears throat> 
it, like I, I don't understand how the numbers are are working out. Right. So like there's some years where it looks like there's 10 students difference between like 14 and 15. There's a change of 10 students. And. But then, you know, in 10 and 11, there was also a change of 10 students and there was a lot. Those numbers were a lot bigger. So what? How sure. Did, so how did I happen? can start. What, I, so uh, <laughs> for, school, for students who attend Pelham School for School Choice, um, Pelham receives $5,000 for the sending district. It also receives an increment if students receive special needs services. Yeah. So one of the things that you're going to note is that it's not an it's not a $5,000 across the board. Hey. Um, and so, you know, because Pelham's right. so small, we, we're, we're pretty cautious. Yeah. It's a good question. I'm not suggesting it, but uh, not asking or not talking about it, but we're pretty cautious about describing that. But uh, depending on a student's needs, it can have a fairly substantial swing. Um, yeah. Nope, that's fine. That's enough. That makes sense to me. I don't need you to yeah. tell me what they needed or who they were or anything like that. No, that's that's fine. That makes sense to me. So, so if a student comes with um, higher needs, they come with their five thousand dollars plus some additional supplement. Yeah, for, Is that so how for that works? instance, if a student had for uh, a prescriptive paraeducator that they needed in order to access the curriculum, the salary of yep. that paraeducator would come from the sending district, which would okay. be well okay. more than five thousand dollars. Yeah, no, 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 that makes, okay, that, so in those years where they're, oh, I see, is that what the SE reimburse is? That um, yeah, and you can see a pretty significant drop from FY19 to FY20, and that's just based on who the students were. Right. Yeah, no, no, that's fine. Okay, all right, well, that makes more sense to me. Thank you. The other thing, the other thing I would add relative to this is that the, the other piece of this, and in, in other words, when we go through our budget process, um, and we look at, uh, you know, our state aid and, you know, our chapter 78 and our other financials as we as we put our budget together. Um, if we have the opportunity to lose use less school choice, uh, we will. And that builds our balance. And so some of the, the other choices we make in other areas are our budget relative to our expenses and or our uh, revenue streams that come in, whether it be chapter 70 or others. Um, impact our choice of how much uh, funds to use in a given year, which which will, uh, even with a large change in students, may result in a in a very positive or very negative result in, in our use of, of choice funds. So that's the other piece that's hard to see on this chart because the rest of the budget's impacting our choices here on how many how much of our funds to use. Okay, no, thank you. That's really good information. And so um, in that middle box where it says plan slash projected, and then it also says additional, what is, what's that? So, so in, what is it, fiscal year 13, and there it says, you know, projected plan 400,000, and then it says additional 57,144. So it could be a circumstance where, uh, you know, additional, um, you know, uh, reimbursements came available, but were also needed within that year. It could be that we were in the fiscal year and we realized our overall budget was was struggling, and so we decided to use school choice uh, to support the budget in in an unanticipated way. I don't know those particular cases right offhand. No, uh, no, no. That's that's fine. It was more a matter of like, how does that come to be a thing? I don't need to know like. Oh, well, we had to plan a garden that had needed fifty-seven thousand dollars worth of roses, obviously. That's fine. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm all set. Sarah, the next you, person can go. <laughs> Sarah, you're muted, I think. Sorry. I'm um, sorry. Can we just stop sharing so I can see people? Oh, sorry about that. No, it's okay. Because now, because I was muted and screaming at the <laughs> computer, so it's not working out for anybody. Uh, Ron, go ahead. Uh, two comments. One about school choice. We've got to continue school choice. Encourage school choice. It may be, um, maybe I may, may, may be misunderstanding this. But I think about the, I think the significant portion of the diversity that Pelham has comes from school choice. That may not be true, but I got the impression that 
uh, school choice students tend to be the diverse students. And second, on enrollment trends, uh, there is a proposal to build a low income housing project across the street from the school. And it's programmed to have 10 two and three bedroom apartments. Likely it'll have children. Uh, I've seen estimates of as high as 25 new students, let's say 20 new students. That may be built in three years. Uh, so uh, if come fiscal 24, fiscal 23, we may have 20 to 25 more students in Pelham School, which are Pelham residents, and get our state aid back. That's it. Um, can I just, oh, sorry, go ahead, Brenda, you can go first. I'll hold my question. So this is just a question because I'm new to the committee. I guess I'm curious about our school choice policies and if we had families who were approaching us and wanting to come in even mid-year, is that something we allow? We do. Uh, we do allow that. That has happened from time to time. Um, you know, obviously this this time you have a very small first grade, which definitely has space no matter if we're in person or not. At other grade levels, it might be a little more challenging with the social distancing requirements that we have, um, but it does happen. I think actually we had, Lee, if I'm not incorrect, it was right after the school year, right, two um, that came in that technically were after the school year started. Um, I just have a quick question just related to um, getting data on the, I know it's 111 across three districts. I can't remember the number for, for just Pelham. If those are, if, if for any of those that are choice students, could, if they say at this point they plan to come back, would they be guaranteed a spot? I mean, I know we would have a good problem if we were completely school choice full, but if there was someone who opted out of Pelham this year who was school choice but wanted to come back, would that be automatic or would they just have to go in like everyone else next year? It's a great question. I know this was answered by people I work with and I don't remember the answer. So I will find it out tomorrow and I'll email all of you. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? Okay, well, this is clearly just the first conversation here. So we'll be revisiting this probably at every other meeting that we have coming up. Um, so yeah, thanks just for the presentation, for being on top of this and we will come back to it. Um, okay, next up on the agenda is the um, question about the health metrics and the MOA. Um, so we put this on the agenda because the negotiations with the union are, are squarely a regional school committee responsibility, um, but we can still talk about it. Clearly there are, you know, if it's some specific negotiation element, that's an executive session thing that we do not participate in. Um, so Ron, this is your chance. <laughs> well, I just, I just want to make a record. Um, can you pause one second? Sorry, Dr. Morris, go ahead if you want to. Yeah, I just want to add one, maybe two sentences of framing, uh, which is that as Ms. Hall, as Chair Hall said, this is a, a regional issue. Um, it obviously affects Pelham, but based on policy, the uh, Pelham School Committee has, and the Amherst School Committee have granted its negotiation authority to the region. Um, I just think I want to make sure, I know you all know that, but I think it's important for the public to be aware that that's, it's not because you all don't care about what happens. It's it's actually based in policy that the, the region negotiates for all three districts. I think the second point I wanna make, just a, a caution is I think uh, committee members can certainly talk about this, but they have to recognize that first point that this could be feedback for the regional representatives uh, to bring back to the regional committee from Pelham. And it's it shouldn't be directly, um, comment shouldn't be directed at the teachers union uh, in my opinion, or the public, but I do think it's a valuable resource and time. And that's why I put it on the agenda for the regional reps to hear from the Pelham School Committee if there's any feedback that's given. But I just wanted to make sure it's directed in the right way um, so that it's clear. Um, and this happened with regionalization in the past. It's happened with any number of issues where it cuts between Pelham and the region that uh, the regional reps hear feedback from the, the full committee 
uh, to bring back with them as they're in executive session and and or negotiations on this issue. But I, I just wanted to frame the politics and the governance of uh, what it is we're talking about and who it should be directed to. Yeah, well, and thank you. Yes, that's great and important to say ahead of time. And also just as, you know, as a practical matter, obviously we have two region reps um, and uh, so I feel like we are in good hands. It's not like we have no voice in this. It's just that for our purposes, if you are the three people who are Pelham only, you just have to go through the proper channels. Um, all right, so Ron, go ahead. I have no idea whether what I'm going to say is inappropriate or appropriate, given oh, those- I know, go ahead. All I wanna say is I support an increase in the trigger metric, which causes schools to close. That's all I want to say. I'm in support of a higher metric, a higher trigger, period. If that's oh. some protocol, I apologize. Nope. No. Ron, that's exactly the kind of feedback that regional reps would look for from their committee on a whole host of topics. So there was nothing, in my opinion, inappropriate about your comment. I agree. Thank you, Ron. Um, well, yeah, and I would, I've provided some, um, some of my feedback and opinions to the chair of the region already, but I would just in this setting, I would echo that. I think that the data and our brief experience with in-person suggest that um, we can do this safely at a number that's higher than 28 new cases per week. So I would also advocate for that. Yeah, Margaret, go ahead. Um, I also shared something with the chair of the regional committee, um, which is that I, I don't know, um, as you may all not know, I cannot participate in the negotiations because I have a family member who teaches in the region. So I cannot be part of that. But what I passed on to the regional chair is that if there's any way to have the, the ensuing discussion, if there's going to be one, be more transparent, I think it would be a benefit to the students because the community is asking to know more about how decisions are being made. So if there's any way to make that possible, I think ultimately it affects our students if we so some transparency, if at all possible, I think would be really important at this stage, or it's going to continue to be really, um, you know, coming at each other instead of trying to work together. Anything else? Yeah, Brenda, go ahead. I just wanted to share what I've heard from some Pelham families is that there have been concern about school opening and then closing and then opening and closing. So that's another thing when, you know, I just wanted to, to make sure that I said tonight that making sure that there's a plan so that these students aren't kind of ping pong back and forth, especially as they get assigned to, to different classrooms and such. Anything else on that? Okay, well, uh, the only the last thing I'll say is just, uh, well, Sarah Bass and Margaret, I appreciate both of you serving on region, but also Sarah Bass participating in the negotiations. And I know all of that happens in executive session, but it's a really big time commitment and doing that on behalf of the region and also representing Pelham there is really important. So we really appreciate that. <laughs> Thumbs up. Um, all right, so next up are the superintendent goals. So we've discussed this at the last joint meeting, um, partly in an effort to streamline the process a bit and have as many shared goals as would make sense. Um, and then, so the next step would be just to take another look at these and then to the extent we feel comfortable to actually um, vote to approve these goals for this year. Um, so Dr. Morris, do you want to talk through this? C. 
Sorry, I can't see anybody. I can... Sorry, I was muted. Oh, wasn't okay. I? oh I well, I'm not the only one who does that then. Okay, go ahead, unmute yourself and talk. Yeah. <laughs> now I'm good, sorry. So the first goal is uh, about social emotional and wellness, and really it's focused on the impact of the pandemic, um, anti-racism curriculum that we're working on and getting implemented, and the economic crisis that's affecting so many of our families. The second goal is, is really a unique to Amherst public school goal, but uh, who knows down the road uh, what this looks like or how it could connect to Pelham, but it's looking to uh, collaborate with Community Action Head Start um, to see if we can open up more preschool seats, particularly as it relates to um, income eligible families. I could imagine in the future having a conversation you know, between Amherst and Pelham on that front, particularly as it would strengthen some grant applications we might work for to expand preschool access. And you've had a, a successful preschool program now for some time in Pelham. The third one uh, was really um, came out of uh, learning from the experience uh, that we're having in, in COVID times and not uh, just going back to the way things were, but actually learning about how things working and how we can improve our system. You can see there's an explicit reference to later start times at the region. I think there's similar learning that we've done at the Pelham and Amherst elementary level um, so that we can start integrating what we've learned into uh, our normal course of action and not just, oh, we're good, there's a vaccine and we're safe and we go back uh, to the way things were. But we're learning a lot every day uh, about how to educate children. And we wouldn't be learning it if it wasn't for this kind of virtual environment or even the in-school where we are uh, have desks in young grades, but we're doing more outside education. So. Uh, outdoors education. So we want to take the best of what's happening and making sure we're integrating it to improve our system over time. The fourth one uh, gets to the topic that was raised earlier um, about um, sixth grade to the middle school, finishing that study and getting to uh, towards a decision. And the last goal is about um, very much what we talked about tonight, um, about fiscal systems and uh, how we might talk about the current fiscal year and shortfalls as well as the FY22 budget. So, so tonight we got a head start in Pelham on that last goal, um, not, not for the best of reasons, but it's really doing a lot of that work and making sure that in this fiscally uncertain time that we're communicating uh, with, 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 I'm communicating with you and we're also communicating with the community about what's currently going on. So that's the, the quick uh, down and dirty summary of the goals as they currently stand. Thank you. So I, I just have a quick question. Does it make sense for us for in Pelham for us to include that second goal that's really AMR specific for this year? Or should we just vote them as is or should we eliminate that one? Mm, uh, I could go either way uh, because they're trying to do things jointly. I think that's fine. Although I, I think it's I'm hard pressed to imagine a very quick impact on Pelham. I mean, I think down the road, we could think about it depending how that project goes. So it may make sense to omit that one and what gets voted because it really is disconnected from the this particular committee. Right. Well, and I just, I'm just maybe just selfishly imagining, because if we vote on it, then we need to evaluate you on it. And then you'd be putting together artifacts and it would, I, I think it would just be hard for us to even evaluate you on that. So I, I feel good about these goals. I guess I would just amend them to just not include the second one. So we would just have the, the other four Pelham only goals. But I'm open to another approach if others really wanna include that. No, any other comments or questions or anything else on the proposed goals? All right, well, I'm gonna, I'll make a motion to um, approve these goals, but to just remove um, the early childhood education one from the list. Is there a second? Second. All right, great. Any further discussion? Okay, I'll move to a roll call vote. Um, Margaret. Stancer, aye. Sarah Bess. 
Uh, Kenny, aye. Brenda? Barlow, aye. Ron? Anino, aye. And Hall, aye. All right, get to work, Dr. Morris. You are going to be busy. <laughs> Um, okay, the, let's see. All right, last item on the agenda is a motion to adjourn. Um, but just before we do that, I will just say, I don't, we haven't had a Pelham only meeting in a while, but I just, I, and I know other committee members just really appreciate the huge amount of work that is going into everything just during COVID, but also now with budget challenges and enrollment declines and everything else. So the folks in this meeting, but also all of the staff at the school and it just, it, it takes a huge amount of work to run a school district, even when everything is awesome and you're just drowning in money, but especially now. So it's just so appreciate all of the work that's happening. And Lee, if you could just pass that message on to all of the teachers and staff and everyone who is keeping the school running virtually or in person that we just really appreciate it. And with that, I will take a motion to adjourn. From anyone. I move to adjourn. Great. Second. All right, no discussion on that. So I'll do a roll call vote, Margaret. Stancer I. Sarah Best. Kenny I. Brenda. Barlow I. Manino I. And Hall I. We are adjourned. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a good night. Good night.